Hey, what's up everyone? This is Ette with another episode of The Company Next Door. The early morning edition, it was the only way to get this guy to come in as I had to get up on a Saturday before nine o'clock. No, it's not true. I'm up at six anyway, but I'm not so much functioning or talking to people. But anyway, here we are. Um, I want to introduce today's guest. He's a good friend of mine. Um, he's, he run, he's, a, he's a contractor, a builder, and we'll talk about that. Um, he's been in this area for 30 or 40 years? No, no. I moved here in 96. So. Okay, so I'm way off. So 96. So you do the math. Um, but anyway, just a, just a great guy. And, I've, and I've, I know a lot of people have done business with him. I know him personally, his leadership skills, his, the integrity that he has, and how much he cares about the detail and the things that he's building. And that's some of the stuff I want to talk about. Um, and and we'll, we'll get into that. So anyway, this is uh, Dave Richards. How are you, man, this morning? Doing good. Thanks for having me, Ate. He's awake and he doesn't know what we're going to talk about. So that's the way I like to keep him <laughs> on their toes. Tell me a little bit about, are you a contractor? Are you a builder? What is the, what do we call you? What's your, what's the word I would call you? I'm a general contractor. I okay. have a B100 license in Utah, which is the largest license you can get in Utah. So you see the big companies, Layton, Oakland, Big D. Ivory Homes, that's how you... They would probably have a B100 okay. as well. Uh -huh. And so I have a B100 license, but I'm kind of more a little bit old school where uh, I have gone to college. I do have a degree, but I still know how to get out and do the work and do that. So I'm a little more hands-on than a lot of B100. Like you're, are members. you on the job? Like you're actually getting your hand, you get your hands dirty. Your shirt doesn't look dirty. Well, because I put a new shirt on almost oh. every day. <laughs> He's got a whole collection of white shirts, by the way. That's our every day of the week. He's got different white shirts. Yeah. So the B100, so why do you have that? Why did you, did you need, is that necessary for the work that you're doing right now? Uh, not for the work I'm doing right at this moment, but when I came to Utah in 96, I came to do a couple large projects in Park City, and I needed to have a B100 to okay. do that size of a project, so gotcha. I'm like, might as well do the big thing, so I'll never be restricted by my licensing. Gotcha. Awesome. So just went big, and that way you're, you're covered for everything yep. you do. Yep. So you came to Heber in 96. Yes. So let's back up a little bit to figure out what, what how you got in here, why you got here. Did you grow up, are you from Idaho? I uh, originally, yeah, okay. from Idaho. So in that, where at, Island Park area? Or? I grew up in Island Park. Uh, but that's a little town right before Yellowstone. Yes. I just went for the first time. I mean, tiny little town. Tiny town, but it's, uh, at one time it had the world record for the longest main street. It's like 40 miles long because the town was just this long road and, and so it had a long main street, even though there wasn't very many people lived there. It just had a long main street that everyone lived on gotcha. So, yeah, so I grew up in Island Park, uh, actually born, born in Provo, Utah. Oh, wow. And then my parents moved to Island Park. Okay. And that's where I grew up. And my dad was injured in a construction accident. And we, was, was he a builder as well? He was a builder okay. as well. Uh, he was a builder as well. And uh, after he was injured, he took a job for the LDS Church, and we went to Scotland. That's awesome. And so we lived in Scotland for a little while and then came back to Rexburg and then settled in Rexburg. How old were you when you were in Scotland and what parts of Scotland? Uh, I actually live in a little town called Cumbernauld. Okay. And so I don't where that is. it's uh, about 40 minutes out of Glasgow. North? I'd have to look at a map. Okay. Well, I don't think it's north. <laughs> look at a map. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I was young at the time. So uh, I was in grade school. I can't tell you exactly which. Uh, but you remember being in oh, Scotland? Oh, yeah. This, this is, this okay. is my memory. Yeah. I went to school, and when you're in the United States, it's like, you know, I had like this this blue BYU t-shirt on, and I had my, my tough skin jeans on. I thought it was pretty cool. I went to school. Everyone had a uniform on. So I came home. I told my mom. I said, we've got to go get uniforms because I just can't be the only kid in this whole school that doesn't have uniforms. And an American. <laughs> yeah, I was an American. So, I mean, and, they, and the, the, the ad thing's worse is that they misunderstood what grade I was going to be in. So they put me in like, let's say I was supposed to be in second grade and they put me in fifth grade. And so they're doing these things and I have no idea gotcha. what's going on. And it was hard. And so we did have a car. My dad had taken the car to work. So we got on our bikes and we would go several miles and everything was just concrete. Uh, the schoolyard was all asphalt. Wow. And so we went there and we bought some uniforms and I started going to school with a uniform. And your dad was building churches over there? My dad or? is building churches. He okay. built what they, it's a stake center in Glasgow, Scotland. Because that's what he That's built. awesome. Yeah. And do you have any, like, what was your big takeaway? Because I know you've been back since mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going as a young kid, it sounds like you have a different experience than going back. What was your takeaway as a kid, like, when you came back? So how long were you there? And then a couple years? Or? We were supposed to be there for three years. Okay. And my dad, in his accident I mentioned to you, 
his arm was smashed, and so he has plastic parts in his wow. arm. So his you know, plastic elbow. And at that time that we're talking, you know, mid seventies, late seventies, you know, orthopedics was nothing like yeah, what it is now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the the weather there, specifically the uh, uh, just the humidity, yeah. just caused havoc on sure. his arm. And so we were we only stayed there. It was less than a year. Okay. He came back and had some surgeries because it was just hurting him so bad. In fact, my mom and dad left me and my sister there. If you can imagine that, leaving your kids in another country for a few weeks and you came back to the States. And that was, I mean, I wasn't young. I wasn't old enough to really know anything different. Yeah. So I was just like, yeah, this is how it is. So. And what was the accident that he was in? How did he break the his arm? Uh, so, you know, what the trusses are. You see big trucks with trusses yeah. that go on top of houses. They were uh, loading that. My dad was up holding the chain and a, a chain broke. And the trusses, oh. <clears throat> almost like a teeter-totter that was heavy, flipped. So it kind of flipped my dad, and he flipped, I think he flew about 50 feet, and then these trusses landed on him, and it crushed him. His arm? It crushed his arm. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. I was a young boy. We were living in Island Park, and I came home, and my dad was uh, laying on the couch and all bandaged up, and I was just like, you know, what happened? And I, I didn't really understand the complexity of what happened. Yeah, because as a builder, I mean, your body's everything. So yeah. at that point, was he... You said he was doing some trusses. So, I mean, was he physically involved? Because I know you like to be, to some mm -hmm. level, involved. Yeah. Was he involved or was he more on the management side? He was more involved at that okay. time. So uh, that, that, that destroyed his income? Or how, how did he work through that? Uh, he had some heavy equipment. And so he would do roads and stuff like that. But as far as going what you call horizontal, which is your vertical, or I'm sorry, your your earthwork, he did, would still do that. Yeah. And then going verticals, you know, the trusses and the wood. And he just that really put a damper on that. Wow. And so he had some good friends that helped him finish some projects that he was doing at the time. But he was able to continue? Finish that, and then that's why he did a change in jobs because when he went to do the churches, build churches, he didn't have to do as much labor because all the, the members would volunteer their labor. And oh, he was just there to you. manage it. And that's why it was a little bit change at pace for him. And that's why we, gotcha. we went to Scotland. He could use his expertise, but not have to use his do body as work. much. Yeah. Um, so then the, the whole family comes back to Island Park. Yep. And at that point, were you interested? Were you going, I, I really want to become a builder? Or were you going, there's no way. I just saw my dad get his yeah. arm crushed. I'm yeah. out of here. I'm going. Yeah. Never, never wanted to be a builder. Really? Yeah, never. <laughs> Hated it. <laughs> Did he drag you on jobs as a kid? Oh, yeah. 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 Get up. at 6 o'clock. It's time to get up and go to work. All my friends were playing Little League Baseball. <laughs> never played one Little League Baseball game my whole life. <laughs> it's always working. Wow. So what happened then? So then you came back. You went to school in Idaho? Uh, high school and then college, yeah. Okay. What college? Uh... I went to Idaho State. Okay. And you were studying for, for contracting? No, no. Oh. No, it's interesting. Like I said, I didn't want to be in construction. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. That was the furthest thing from your mind. Yeah, I was like, I'm not going to do this. I did it to put myself through school. I got married, had some kids going to college, had a job for a big construction company called Intermountain Construction, and which was a good job going to school. And uh, my degree is actually in corporate training. Huh. So I'm supposed to be uh, organizational development, organizational behavior, educational psychology. Oh, that's, that's my degree. Didn't know that. <laughs> okay. So anyway, that's awesome. But, but construction was good enough to get me through school. Yeah. And then, uh, right, I had this job, and the job was good enough. I just I wasn't gonna get any another job that was better. In my degree, I would work for more like a Fortune 500 company. Yeah. So that would require me to move like you know East Coast, you know, somewhere yeah, the, I didn't want to go. The promised land, yeah. Yeah, those the types, promised those land. Type of places, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I didn't want that. I wanted to stay where it was smaller. So I ended up just uh, staying in the construction industry, and then I had a job opportunity where someone came to me and said, "Hey, we got this big project in Park City, Utah. Uh, we know you. We want to work with you." Uh, was going to take the, your B100 license. Uh, I did it and moved to Utah. So how, like roughly, how old were you at this point when you finally like f committed and said, all right, this is what I'm going to do? Or when you figured out that That's, I'm not going into the corporate things, I'm, yeah. I'm going to be a builder. I graduated from college about 25, 24, 25. Okay. And then in 29, I was 26 when I came 26. to Utah. 26. And you had a couple kids at that time? Yeah, we had uh, just had our third Okay. Just had our third. So through the job that you had, they came to you and they said, hey, we really like you. We want you to do this. Go get your... I, I knew the individual from earlier in my life, and he had a son that was about my age, and okay. he wanted someone to kind of help him and his son, and I, it was me.
Wow. So do you remember that time, like if you were to go back and think about like that moment, was it a conscious moment like, I guess I'm doing this, was the thing I fought my whole life and that, you know, was there ever a time or, or was it just kind of step upon step and you woke up and five years later like, oh, I guess I'm a builder? Uh, I was probably step upon step that way. It wasn't like this aha moment okay. or anything. I just realized if I'm going to provide well for my family, this is probably the best thing to do it. And I always thought I'll just do this until something better comes along. I've had a few things come along. But I always kind of come back to construction. And did you have, what skills did you have at that time when you were going to get this license? Did you, did you know how to frame a house? Did you know oh, how to Oh, yeah, do I knew everything. And so I grew up doing it. Yeah. And then I worked for a large company. And my job for a large company, we did a lot of government work. Okay. And we would bid a project uh, about once a week. And I was an estimator for them. So can you imagine... Let's say you do a school or a, a yeah. government thing. They bring a stack of specifications that thick to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And at that time, there were 16 divisions in the in the construction industry. They changed it now. Then you have a stack of plans that big. So every week, I would study a set of plans and the specifications, and I would do all the takeoffs for that. And so, I mean, it was... It was, they were paying me to get a great education. That's awesome. And so when I worked for this big company, I was an office person. And so oh. growing up, I did all the, ha- yeah, the legwork. Yeah, you, you learned all the production and the, side. Yeah. And the company really liked that because I knew how things would go. Because most guys come out of college and they don't want to do any work. They just want right. to tell They don't people have that experience. Do. They don't see everything connecting. Yeah, so that's what I did. And so that gave me a really good balance. And that's so when I went to get my B100, I'd already been working on, you know, big multi-million dollar projects. So it wasn't odd for me to do that what was the project in park city can you tell us or is that, yeah is yeah, something no, private no. Or? yeah no so it was uh they had some property there it's at the base where the canyon ski resort is now at that time it was called wolf mountain and before that was park west okay um and they had a really nice property there and we took that and we we zoned it and we started building it and that was in 98 that time frame there and the okay. co- name of that project is called Timberwolf Lodges. Okay. And we started on that project, and lo and behold, we're right in the middle of that, and uh, we got to where there was an election that year, and I remember the, the hanging chat, and the economy just went crazy, mm-hmm. and things kind of dropped off. And so in, our, in the middle of our, between first and second phase, the economy really dropped off, and so we lost all our buyers. Wow. That was pretty tough. And then uh, from there, they still had some property. We waited a couple of years, wait, licked our wounds, did a comp- uh, did a project called Juniper Landing. Okay. If you know where that is in Park City, at the base of the canyons. Same thing. In fact, we sat down. There was three of us. Well, there was actually four of us. And actually, Juniper Landing was my name. I, we, we all kind of, you know, throwing in these different things oh, that's right cool. here. Just throwing and, names, trying to find one that fits. Yeah. And then we did, uh, and were called, so Fairway Springs was the next one. Then we went to Juniper Landing. Well, why, so, why Juniper Landing? Where did that come from? Uh, well... Actually, Fairway Springs was my idea. The other one, Juniper Landing, was someone else. I liked okay. Fairway Springs because we, at the time, they were going to do a golf course yeah, there. Yeah, I was saying, it sounds like a golf type. Yeah, yeah. so we were trying to get something nice, peaceful, that, yeah, yeah, there was there were some wetlands there that was below us. We're like, let's just take this wetlands. We can, it's a dry, uh, the golfing area, so Fairway worked out good. So anyway, so we did a couple big projects yeah. at the base of this Canyon Ski Resort. So, so I'm going to leave the timeline for a second because I've okay. got a question. Um, being in building and construction, which I'm not, um, it seems often so tied to the economy. Yeah. And, you know, especially like right now with the coronavirus, you know, <laughs> there was 08, there's this. We're talking, you've seen a lot of this. Yes. Has your lifestyle been tied as well? I mean, how do you, how do you navigate that as, as a builder? Mm. I think contrary to what most people think, I have a pretty conservative life. Yeah. Um, I have more than I ever dreamed I would have growing up. Sure. And so I was taught you you make money, you pay things off, and you buy something mm. you do with cash. And so I, I've missed out on some real home runs. You know, when people <laughs> have really leveraged themselves and it yeah. worked out good, that was that but was. But that was that's never been your your play. Not so much leveraging mm-hmm. massive debts, but just more cash payoff, move to the next thing. Yeah, and so I've huh. kept small. So it, it, when it was big, and I was doing millions of dollars a month and lots of employees, I was able to handle that. And then when it got down to where it's just me and maybe one other person, I handle that too. So has that happened? Like, so with, like with 08, did you have to scale down and just cut the team down? Or what I was, was right that? in the middle of a big project in 08. And so when everyone was scaling down, I was doing really well. But that eventually t- terminated about 10 or 11. Okay. So it did catch up to me. And I started another company in the oil field, but 
and then it just things started kicking back up again. So. And then even this year with the the coronavirus, mm-hmm. has that been has that impacted you as at all? Or? Uh, busier now than ever before, but in construction you have a timeline, so you have starts, you're in the middle of a project, and you're finishing a project. Okay. So I'm I was in the middle of projects and finishing projects. So that's happened, but my starts have all postponed. And so I'm going to have a little bit of a dip now because gotcha. my starts where I should be in the middle of something now, we're just starting them now. Gotcha. Okay. So there's that, there's that little gap. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So you finished the Juniper Land in your park city. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that was kind of your gateway to get to this area. Yes. Kind of. I mean, yeah. uh-huh. okay. Now, how did you get to Heber? Or why uh, did you get to Heber? Did yeah. you live in Park City? No, what, no. What, heavens, what, uh, no. Uh, it's like it's heavens, been, no. No, heck, yeah. <laughs> well, if I, there's only a few places I'd want to live in. City. Yeah, it's crowded now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how I got the Heber was when I was a missionary in Alaska, there was a couple people that were my missionary companions. One was uh, Jason Mayer. And then when I was in high school, my high school football coach married a girl from Heber. And they'd always talk about how awesome Heber was. So when I uh, moved to Utah, I lived in Island Park. And in Island Park, probably there was no one that lived within about a quarter of a mile from me and my family yeah. right on the Snake River. Well, when I came to Utah, I rented a place in Sandy, Utah. And probably within a quarter of a mile, there was a couple thousand and, people. And this was this is your first time living in Utah? My first time living okay. in Utah. And you're in Sandy. And I'm and, in Sandy. Okay, gotcha. Which, and is, I'm like, which is a lot, for those of you who don't know, Sandy is like right outside Salt Lake. It's uh, houses and it's jammed up. Yep. Okay, yep. gotcha. So we go to Sandy and I'm like, this is not for me. Well, I'm always <laughs> remembering, uh, you know, my missionary companion, my high school football coach talking about how awesome Heber is. And Heber is closer to the Park City. Yeah. So my wife's pregnant. We drive to Heber. And this is before the road has been improved like it is now. And she's sick with morning sickness. Oh, oh the, the freeway coming yeah, down from Park coming, City. Yeah, coming okay. down. And so you come off of Jordan L, then it was just this bumpy kind of really? two-lane road. Yeah. Okay. So we're driving in, and uh, and she's like, she's laying there. She's feeling sick. And she looks over, <laughs> and she's like, I can't even believe you thought that we would move to someplace like this. <laughs> No, what, what? Yeah, and so I Be, was because like, of the the dirt road, because I'm sure back then it was, it was not many people like it is now. She was just sick. She was just sick. She was yeah, just sick. Yeah, okay. So it wasn't. It was just the circumstance. Yeah, yeah. But when we were in Sandy, every weekend we would find ourselves in Park City just because we just, had to get out of the city. Gotcha. And so I was doing a job, and uh, I actually came over. I, w- I w- hadn't done a job in in Heber at that time. Someone had me go look at a job in Timber Lakes, and I'm coming down Timber Lakes. In the church house on the LDS church house on Center Street, they were just doing the the earthwork and the flat work on that. It wasn't okay. a church yet. And right beyond there, there was a couple little houses. And so where Tint Meadows, the subdivision now, it was just all streets. There wasn't houses in there. Wow. And there was a couple of houses on Center Street, and one of them had a for rent sign in it. So I called my wife. I said, hey, there's a for rent sign on this little house in Heber. And she says, she no said, matter what it is, get it. Oh, Okay. And I said, okay. And so that, and so I did, I rented that house sight unseen for her. And we, we moved from Sandy to Heber, to and, Heber. and uh, met people like Paul Balf. Yeah. Do you know what Paul Balf is? Paul was great, man. So he was my neighbor. He lived right kitty yeah. corner to me at that time. So just and he to, owns Delta stone. Yes. So he does a lot correct. of stone work. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. yeah. And so we, we met each other. So it was just, it was great. So that's how I got to Heber. So, and, then, and then since you've been here, I mean, I feel like this is, you still do a lot of work. You work in Park City and Heber, or are you mostly in Park City? Uh, both. It uh, used to be almost all Park City in okay. Summit County, and now there's more Wasatch County and okay. Heber as well. So the, the, this is your home ground? Yeah. Yeah, between the two counties, that's where I'm doing 95% of my work. Okay, cool. So you got here, and at that point you had three three kids? Or at that point I had three children. Three kids, and mm-hmm. you're renting a house off of Center Street. Yeah. And there's no church there. You're, there's, and all, Tim Meadows is all streets. I can't picture this, right, because I've it's only crazy. been here for seven years. Where, you, where your house now is just a field. And then That's had, crazy. And there was a big pile of uh, topsoil. So when they, they did the Tim Meadows neighborhood, they stripped all the topsoil off of it so they could sell it back to the people that buy the homes. And so you you would be in like what a phase two would be, and so that was really just we'd go over to that pile of dirt, and my kids we would we had a four wheeler and, and a little sled, <laughs> and they would sled down the hill. Really, it's about right where your house is. So. That's funny. So, yeah. how did you establish yourself? So now you're here, you're renting a house. How, how did you grow your business? How did you get work? How did you get your name out there? What was the to where you are today? I think I was just really blessed. Uh, I've never been good at marketing. Okay. Um, you know, my degree is in corporate training and not yeah. in marketing. And so I didn't do a good job at that. But what I did do a good job at is I would take care of the people that I would work for. And so word of mouth would happen. And 
you know, for someone that's in business for themselves, you're always like, okay, where's the next yeah. job coming from? Yeah, where are we going? And it would just always work out. I'd finish a job, and then about the same time I'm fishing it, someone I know says, hey, someone's coming to this area. Would you be interested in building the house? I would. Give them a budget, work with them, and then the next job would start. So on what you just said, I need to dive a little deeper. You, you mentioned that you... Uh, you just put, you weren't great at marketing, so you just put your energy, your efforts into giving that customer a great experience. Yeah. What, what does that look like from, from a contractor, from a builder? Like what, can you give me some examples of yeah, well, this what is, makes that? This is my perspective. Yeah. Okay. Um, in construction, there's kind of three main things that people look at. You know, how fast can you do it? Yep. How cheap can you do it? Yeah. How good can you do it? Yeah. Okay. And I look at that, I'm like, okay, someone's told me one time, you only really can't you can't have all three. You can have two of those things, but you can't have all three of those things, right? Yeah, you can have fast and cheap or cheap. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so, I'm, I, so I kind of had that little bit of thought. So for me, I always felt like I wanted someone to feel like they, I was, they were my number one. So okay. if you're my client, if I'm building your house, you call me. I'm always answering your phone. You're not like the number 12 house or the gotcha. number 18 house for me. And, hey, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm scheduled to be there next week. Can we set a time next week? It's like I'm giving you priority yeah. over everything else and I think that's one of the things that <clears throat> excuse me that, that helped me with that is that my mentality was I'm going to make sure everyone feels like they're the number one mm. priority interesting is that common have you seen that common in a, in in the industry is that because I don't feel like I hear that when I talk to people who just built houses with builders around they're like oh yeah they're building they come and started my house then they left for a month and came yeah. back and it seems what I hear it's a common frustration like so I guess I'm answering my own question, but it seems like a lot of people aren't offering that. I don't think they do because unfortunately in our world today, you know, I'll meet with someone and we go through a budget. Their first thing is, you know, well, how long is this going to take me? And I'm like, well, you know, anywhere from seven to 12 months, depending on what the house is. Then the next thing is, well, how can we cut costs? Right off the bat. How do we cut costs? Mm -hmm. and everyone you, says that. Is that like a, a, a warning flag for you or are you just like, ah, oh, here I just we know go? Every, I know everyone says that. So, you so you're I'm, just used to it. You're just I'm used to it. What I have to do is I have to hedge myself on not sacrificing too much because they don't understand what they're sacrificing. Sure. And so I just did a project. I gave someone a budget. They said, we need to shave some money off. I'm like, okay, we're going to sacrifice. That's fine. Do whatever. Just take the money off. So I get a couple of bids. I'm like, well, here's, it was a painter and a drywall. I said, we could use these guys, but the, the product probably won't be as good. That's fine. Just do it. Well, we do the job. Guess what they're unhappy with? The paint and the drywall. Exactly. Yeah. And so I just felt bad because I should have said, you know what? I should have just stood my ground and said, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to please them. I'm trying to do whatever mm -hmm. they can. They're the ones that, that's paying to do it. So we'll do it. And then they're not happy. This kind of a reflects on me poorly too. So where is the line there? Because I, I totally hear it. And I know like, I'm in the landscape side of it, so I'm not as involved as building a home, right? Like, you're like their best friend, well, or worst enemy, but you're like a member <laughs> of their family for a minute. Mm -hmm. And so I imagine there's got to be a line between pleasing them and just taking all the stuff that, like, like you said, they don't understand things. Yeah. The types of wood, the cost, they just want, they just see that number. But then there's got to be a number to where you, you're trying to please them and work with them, but there's got to be a point where you're just like, I can't, because like you said, it all comes back to me. Like, yeah. how do you find, how do you know? Well, I'll, I'll give You've you, got to be, been in some tough situations. I, I have. I'll give you the line that I use. Okay. I tell people, I'm here to tell you what you need to know, not what you want to hear. Okay. And so that usually works pretty good. And they'll ask me, and I, when I do a budget for someone, it'll be anywhere from 80 to 120 line items. Yeah. And so I go through each one. And so if they're like, I can't believe this is going to cost us $1.5 million, and I can show it every little line item that's there and so they know exactly where that budget's built up and like well i know how come cabinets are this much i'm like well we can save money on cabinets but this is what you're going to sacrifice is that what you want to do because yeah. it's interesting everyone wants to have a dialed in number like i want the exact yeah. budget but they get they give me this, this vanilla plans like hmm. well what kind of what kind of floor do you want well i i, I don't know what kind of cabinets do you want oh i, I don't know but they it, know what they don't want yeah, but then so I'm just saying, and inevitably they want, they show me a picture on Pinterest and they're like, we really like this. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. well, that's really expensive, yeah, yeah. you know, so you have to gauge what, what that is. So, Wow. So it sounds like a lot of your work really is before you even start breaking ground. I mean, that sounds like the hard part. I've been, I've got a client right now I've been working with for almost three years. Haven't started anything yet. Wow. Imagine doing so many budgets for someone. I haven't got 
not even a penny. Yeah. Another person, we're getting ready to start. Same thing. I've worked with them for two years. Haven't even got a penny yet. I was going to ask you, so the your estimate process, that's a big deal. That's a lot of time. A lot of time. Lot of, so it, it, you could spend hours. You could spend days on an estimate. Yeah, yeah. And you don't get paid for that? Okay. Uh, I know some builders that do. They'll they'll require like, hey, I'll do. I'll give you a budget for five thousand dollars. I just haven't felt like that's where I need to be. Gotcha. Yet, so. Wow, that sounds intense. And then once you begin the building, I mean, I do you run into all types of uh, problems, or have you gotten to a point now where the process you, you kind of got a process so dialed in, it's mm. the same few problems. You know, it's expected not to handle it. Or every job you learn something on. I Even always, still, you're learning. Oh yeah. At this okay. Absolutely. I think if you've stopped learning, then you've really miss the boat hmm. I think you got to learn on something every day it's interesting I'll talk to young people and they say yeah, I, I, I know I know what's going on I'm like you know even for me I'm learning something new yeah. every day yeah absolutely yeah so I think that's a that's a big thing so um, as far as learning the lessons and what's on there every project's a little bit different very similar principles but everything's gonna have its own little twist okay okay so I think that's something that's consistent is that you're always going to have issues probably the biggest thing right now is scheduling i mean yeah. you know it's busy and there's a few people i know i want to use as subcontractors and as long as their price is fair i'm going to use those people yeah. but you still have to schedule them there because there's everyone else that's trying to do the same thing have there been times when you just your subs just weren't able to get where you need to you just jumped in you grab yeah. you grab your sons and you jump in because because taylor works for you so. yeah taylor works for me now yeah. we just finished a job that same way it's a wow. it's a log edition here in heber and you don't find very many people that can even do logs that don't even have the the tools to do logs because you have to like cut it in and lay them like yeah, yeah different yeah. Whole, different all whole different thing can't find anybody to do that and huh. so i jumped in and just did it which I mean, part of me, I really like that, but the other part of me, it's hard to make money doing that because, again, how how cheap can we do this? Yeah, it's yeah. like, well, there's not really people that can even do this, but I can, so. So what's one thing you would say to people maybe who are listening or watching that go, ooh, I want to build a house, or they're looking? Mm -hmm. it, it, what's, give me a tip or two, like, as they come to you before, like, get this dialed in or be ready for this. What are some, yeah. some tips or something to save the headache of getting into it? Well, first of all, you want to have a lot that you really like. Okay. And then you can, to me, the home, I don't do just the cookie cutter stuff. You're all custom. For the most part, yeah. And so every lot is going to be unique. So every lot's going to have its own <laughs> orientation with the sun, its view. And so you got to design this home around the lot. So that's number one. Mm -hmm. If people really like a, a home and there's nothing, a house plan, and there's nothing specific or special about the property, then that's a little bit different. But most of the people I'm dealing with, there's something really unique about the property gotcha. and they're trying to orient the home on the property. The property yeah. Next thing sense. is you want to work with someone, it depends how much, how much involvement you want to be. If you're going to build a house and you just want to show up and have it done and it's what they call a turnkey, that's great. You're going to pay a designer and an architect to do all the things you want to do. A lot of people, their dream is to build a home and they want to be very Part involved. Part of the process. Uh -huh. yeah, and so you got to find yeah. people to be on your team. And so you go to a, a designer that will help you with your design and you can give them, you know, this is how big I want it. Okay. This is the budget. One of the problems I'll have is that people do all these things. They have their, their dream home designed on the property they've just purchased and they come to me and they, they, I get a price. They say, give us a budget. I give them a budget and it's a million dollars. And they're like, whoa, we can only spend $500,000. Mm. And we just spent all this money on this design. And I'm like, I, I wish you could have came and talked to me because it's not like I was gonna charge them money. I could at least give them what we call value engineering, meaning helping them know what the costs are gonna be. So, so value engineering is kind of like a pre, getting ready for the engineering, like so you don't go to the thing and say, I want five, I want five bedrooms, but I only have $400,000. Mm -hmm. So what can we do to make that? So value engineering is, Instead of designing, imagine you're going to go buy a car and you're like, this is what I want in a car. And you go and you have no idea what the Mercedes or the Tesla or whatever sure. is out there. And so you go and of course, you like all these elements of the Mercedes. Yeah. And you're like, okay, that's going to be $80,000. And you're like, whoa, I only could spend thirty five. Well, if you'd have told me thirty five in the beginning, let's go look at the Honda Accord. It's exactly. going to be a really right. good car and do everything you need it to be, but it's not going to have the bells and whistles. But often you don't know that as, a, as a, like, I'm in that process now. I'm going to build a house and I go to an architect and he's like, 
like, okay, what do you want? I'm like, well, I'll tell you what I want. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he's like, well, it's eight grand for the design. Okay, but like you're saying, I have no clue. Like, I might get it back and he might say, hey, here's the price. And I'm like, whoa, that ain't, you know. Yeah, exactly. So th- I didn't know there was a step beforehand. So I'm just telling you, that's why yeah. I think people don't realize They can that. come and talk with the builder, talk with someone yeah. and just get that. Yeah, you're with it right now. You're doing a house plan for yourself. You're going to get the prices back and you're like, whoa, how can we save $200,000 to what we want to be? And it's like, if you could start in the beginning and understand some of those differences, that's going to save you a lot of time and effort. That makes sense. So that's one of the things I would tell people is that, you know, make sure that you have an idea of what the the costs are going to be. And if it's too good to be true, it probably is. It probably is. is. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I I just did a project or bid on a project in Deer, or is the Deer Valley area. Gave me a budget. What can we do to save it? Gave them some ideas. They did the opposite. They're like, they added snow melt system in the driveway. They added sport cord underneath the garage. All the things that are just making it go up. Yeah. I'm like, if you want to get to a point, this is what we need to do. Uh, into it a couple weeks. They said, hey, we've got a builder that can do it for our budget. And I'm like, good luck. <laughs> you know, it's not like, I know what the costs are and I make a certain amount. And that's sure. Right, so. Yeah. so you would say to a homeowner then before you spend all that, really... Get that. I mean, do you recommend like figure out, find the right property? And, and then once you have the property, if, if you love the property, build the house to fit the property. Yep. But then talk to a builder or talk, get that knowledge before you start mm-hmm. doing plans, before you start making all these pictures in your head. Find a builder or two that you trust and get some idea of what the real costs are going to be before you okay. get too crazy with your design. So you're getting what you want that will work on the property. Okay, that makes sense. So, all right, cool. So jumping back into the timeline, you were here. Obviously, you didn't stay in the rental on Center Street forever. No, no. Your business grew. You've had a lot of success. Um, you've got a yard in town. Mm-hmm. You've got your son. You brought your son on. Yeah. And fast forward, how long? So you've been in, since 96, was that? 96 is when I Your company started? Heber. Yeah, yeah. Somewhere 96. around there. Yeah, uh-huh. So, and you said you're still learning lessons all the time. Absolutely. Which is, I think that's a great lesson for, for those that are listening. You, you, you're never, you, you don't stop learning. Nope. You're never ending learning. So what do you do now to stay interested and to stay excited? Like, are you at a point where, I mean, maybe you're still <laughs> learning. That keeps you engaged. But after so many years, I would think, do you just want to check out? Do you want to hand it to your son? Are you still excited? Is hmm. there anything in the future that you're like, oh, that's cool. That I, I can't wait till they 3D print homes or whatever. Like, where? Yeah. What do you? What keeps you going? That's a great question <laughs> because yeah, I am getting tired of that. Uh, I, my goal is to turn it over to my son. I'm trying to instill in him values and knowledge that I feel like I've had. I tell him, I said, I want you to stand on my shoulders. So you yeah. know, from where I'm at now, I want you to go, go take it to the next that. level. Exactly. Stand on my foundation. Sure. Yeah. Um, People go to home shows, and there's cool things in home shows. It just doesn't interest me. I'm, yeah. just, I'm just tired because I've seen, You've seen the, it the new thing that comes in, and then what's really cool this year, in two or three years, they're like, yeah, that's that's old. <laughs> and so it's hard for me to stay excited about the construction side of it. I'm more interested in people. And so now when I do a project for someone, I want to know about them. Like, what's their story? How many kids do they have? And so... You sound like me. (laughs) It's kind of more different that way. So I don't... Construction is just what I've got to do to make the living. But when I meet people, and and it's good. And it's, you know, everyone has, you know, successes and failures in their life. And so as you get to find out who these people are, it's it's just good to know who they are. And that's why I started the show. We started interviewing people because I was driving through the neighborhood and I'm like... This person owns this. This person's done this. And just, you know, middle-class neighborhood. It was really hitting me. Like, I don't hear the stories. Yeah. And then as I sit down and spend an hour, I'm like, that's amazing. And, every, and like you're saying, everyone's got a story and everyone's got lessons you can learn. Yep. And that's that's actually what I'm interested in, too. I, I, uh, yeah, I haven't been that excited about loans for a while. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I, I should do what you're doing. I should interview people because I want to <laughs> know what their stories are. <laughs> um, so, let me ask you this. Um, with With where you're at now, let me ask you this. Can you share with us one of the hardest times of building the company the last 30 years one of mm-hmm. you know because i feel like we learn a lot from people's failures mm-hmm. and and when people share that hard moment where you just thought you talked to your wife kim i don't know like we're about i'm about to get out of here or something right was there yeah. a moment or a particular instance where you just go oh i've had a couple situations one that comes to mind i was in the middle of a, a big project in park city and it's, this one was actually juniper landing we were in the middle, we probably had about $23 million worth of construction going. And things were getting really bad with the economy. So bad that uh, 
the banks are saying, the, the, the people that put 10% down. So you imagine someone puts 10% down on a condo. That's in between $100,000 to $150,000. And they're saying, just keep our money. We're done with this. We're walking out of here. Wow. So we had some people coming in and uh, I had, there was four of us as partners. I only owned 15% of it, but I mean, it was about an $80 million uh, yeah, project. Take, so I'll I, take 50% I, of it. Yeah, I, I was happy with that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the guy that was one of the, the two main principal guys, they were basically losing everything. Wow. And uh, I felt pretty lucky I didn't lose everything, but I was the only guy that was still answering the phone calls. Really? They, they were just putting their head in the sand? They could, yeah. They were gone. I can't imagine. They were gone. And so everyone's calling me. And it was it was pretty stressful, stressful time in life. But I held in there. Cost me some money. But, you know, I still use that a lot when I'm talking to people. And I'm like, listen, I went through these times. Yeah. And, I, you know, I still have the same phone number. People could contact me. Yeah, I did everything there. I could to make it. And, I, you know, there wasn't any revenue income for me. I was just there gotten it out to make sure that I did. Took care of the customers, took mm -hmm. care of the project. Yeah, so that was one time it was that way. There's been some other times when the economy goes down. Uh, when things got really bad in about 11, just after this time I described to you, I had a chance to go to North Dakota, and I started a business up there with a good friend of mine, and we did just fine. In the oil. And we were in yeah, the oil, oil industry. industry. Uh huh. And so, yeah, I was like, I think I was younger, and I mean, I gave me some gray hair and put on a little bit of weight, but I survived. <laughs> what do you say to people that are in that spot right now, the entrepreneurs that are maybe younger or starting and they're just going, uh, you know, because every, everyone I've ever talked to has been through that moment yeah. where they're gaining the weight and they're just losing, they can't sleep. Yeah. How did you get through it? What do you say to that kid or that man? I, well, the way I, I got through it was I was blessed, number one. Uh, I worked hard. Yeah. And then I turned everything else over to faith, which is, you know, have faith in the Lord. Mm. And I just felt like, you know what? He knows what I need to do. I'm doing all that I can do. And it's in his hands. And I think that uh, more than not, I think that's where life is. I don't care if you're religious or not. You know, you're always going to be tested right to that very point. Yeah. And you're going to see what you're made of. And then that's what happens. Yeah. And I, I love that. And I find that's often uh, turning what you said, turning over to faith. That's not an easy thing for men and women, but I'm going to say men because I, mm -hmm. you know, to do, yeah. to just let go in, in a sense, right? I guess it's not just talk, talking, oh, I don't care. I'm going to walk away, put my head in the sand like some of your partners, but it's this idea. I'm going to do all that I can, and then I'm going to let go and have trust that someone's going to catch me. Yeah, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I've been on times where it doesn't work, you know, <laughs> and I just walk by. I'm like, okay, you know, there must be something better and something I need to learn from this. Something bigger. Yep. Yeah. So what is one of the best, you know, you, we talked about some of the ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you about an up real quick. What has been the most exciting time? I mean, you've, um, and you haven't mentioned too much, but I, I know what you do and you've had a lot of success in business, but it doesn't get to your head. And I know that. What has been, ha, has the ride been exciting? Have you been able to see it? Wow. Kim, we're taking off, you know, and, and all this, <laughs> or is it just more like you're just coasting or what are, What's that been like? Because that's every young entrepreneur's dream is to get to a point where the business is paying the bills and they can buy more properties and they can, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. Have, have you been in the moment or has it just been like, huh, this is how it is? I think for the most time, my my shoulder has been to the will. Okay. <laughs> You're just too busy working. I'm just working <laughs> most of the time and I don't, I, I'm starting to have a little bit of regret by working so much. Okay. And so I'm trying to take more time and do some of the things I really want to do. Uh, my parents and my wife's parents are kind of the sunset of life, and I I feel like I need to spend more time with them, which I'm trying to do. Yeah. Uh, as far as enjoying things, yeah, I remember you know you're working hard, and I remember when I started having more large projects going and making good money every month. But I'm just like, you know, I wasn't crazy like, what am I gonna leverage myself on? It was yeah. like, I just took I took all my debt out. You know, just That's started awesome. taking all my debt out. And That's that was awesome. that was a good thing for me. And I think when I realized I didn't have any debt to anybody and I still had some money in the bank, that was pretty good to do that. I think now it's more about just doing a job for someone than they're nothing's better than to work hard for someone and see that they appreciate what yeah. you're doing for them. Yeah. And I think in for me, going outward, that's a thing. I, you know, I don't care if it's a mechanic or someone I'm working with, and I really see they do something for me. I want them to know, like, man, 
thanks for it. thanks yeah. for doing that for me because I really appreciate you doing it because everyone has their own little skill and you've got to appreciate that or else people it's like well why am I doing this yeah what, what's so I know it wasn't it wasn't a day like I remember the day I had my first hundred thousand dollars and I remember the day I lost my first hundred thousand dollars <laughs> I mean I, I remember that I really do and I was just like wow well, that's, that's yeah. easy come easy go that's awesome what are some of just give me a few and kind of winding down some some big takeaway lessons that you've learned over, you know, three plus decades, maybe more. I'm terrible at math and I'm not going to even try. But <laughs> over these years, you know, we've talked about just putting your shoulder to the woods, keep working and, and uh, paying off debts. <laughs> what are some of the things that you would say if your son came to you today and said, Dad, I want to start a new business. I need some advice. Yeah. Well, I do have a son that's coming to me as a couple of them that are doing businesses. <laughs> I have four All sons. All right, so what do you tell them? Four sons and yeah. one son-in-law and every one of them wants to do something That's awesome. outside and do their own thing, which I think is good. I tell them, number one, you got to be realistic about what the expectations are. Sure. You know, I've got a son and he came to me and he has a, uh, Someone he knows has his business and he's making like a quarter of a million dollars a year and he thinks that's what he's going to do. I'm like, okay, son, let's, let's think about this. You know, why what you're going to do is better than anybody else. Why are people going to buy this product from you? So be realistic about that. Okay. The other thing is you got to do something that you enjoy doing and I've got a son right now that's making a lot of money and I wouldn't say he's really enjoying what he's doing and so I'm telling him I'm like listen son you're in a unique position you're making a lot of money right now right take that money and do the thing don't waste it on the temporal things put on things that are going to perpetuate itself so that you can't you don't have to do this for a long time yeah yeah so we, we talk about that and you know you always want to do something that you enjoy and uh, part of what I went to college in is, is that not everyone should go to college. Some people go to trade schools. There's, you know, there's people that have to be yeah. a policeman, a fireman, sure. a construction <laughs> worker. Not everyone is going to have this need for this degree. And so you got to value that. Yeah, you got to really think through it to see if it's a good fit. Exactly. And so you got to find out what's good for you. And not everyone, you know, just because someone wants to be a mechanic or an equipment operator, yeah. that's fine. Enjoy what it is that what you're going to do. And I'm always telling people, find a skill that someone will pay you for. Because I've talked to a lot of people and they're going to college and whatever. And I'm like, what's your degree in? And they tell me something. And I'm just thinking to myself, yeah. well, you know. No one uses that. Yeah, right? why? I, that's great that you're obtaining that knowledge in yeah. that perspective in life. But, you know, why would I pay you to do something for me? And so I think number one, get a skill that someone is willing to pay you for. And that's, and then and if you enjoy doing that skill, you're going to be a happy person. Yeah. That makes sense. And then you, and then, so you have one son that is hoping you're hoping and working that through that he'll take over the business. Yeah. And yeah. you'll go back to Island park where you started. I don't think I'll ever retire. I think I'll always <laughs> be a part of it, yeah. but I want to be where I don't have to be here working yeah. five or six days a week. I'm going to be like, Hey, I'm going to go to Idaho for three days or go yeah. to Lake Powell for three days or yeah. wherever it is. And it's, it's okay. Everything doesn't crash or, or screech to a halt sure. because I'm not here. Things just going to continue to move as they should. I got to ask one question. I thought of this on the way over. Are you good with Legos? <laughs> you got grandkids. I mean, Legos yeah. weren't around when you were a kid. How can you build? Are you? I mean, oh yeah, I can do that. Are you, the you thing I don't like about Legos <laughs> is you build it and then they just tear it apart. <laughs> yeah. You can put all that effort into it and it's gone. Did you see the Lego movie? I have not seen. Okay. The Lego well, anyway, movie. The, at the end of it, the dad takes he he wants it to stay away, so he takes the glue and he glues all the pieces in, and he destroys <laughs> the kid's creation. So it sounds like where you go. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. But you have grandkids now. Yeah, and I you love play grandkids. with them, and, and they oh, come and spend it. time and. What I love about grand, I've got right now. I have four grandchildren, three more on the way. Wow! Uh, of the four, I have three are boys. One's a girl. I in my life, I had four boys and one daughter. Okay. So I really pay attention to my granddaughter because I only had one yeah. little girl growing up, yeah. and that's really special to me. Her name's Andy, and I and she's fun, and I do that. But I, I love all the grandkids. What, yeah. what do I like to do now? Yeah, so what are you doing with them? I mean, I know you travel to Yellowstone, Lake Powell, but what is the, Yeah. what do you find in the enjoyment? It, it's gonna be cliche, but I like to do a lot with my wife and my family. Like I said, uh, I spend a lot of time working and doing other things. Yeah. So I can't go back and make up those lost times, but I, I can do you what can I can right now. now. Yeah. And so 
I mentioned last week I was in Idaho, yep. so I could be with my family, my mom and dad, and my wife's mom and dad for a little bit. It sounds like you're making a conscious effort to do that now, mm-hmm. like to say I got to cut out some hours and really focus on more on the family. Yeah, which is not easy. Yeah, I mean it's hard when that yeah, it means you're saying no to certain things. It's, yeah. In in work wise, to me it's good, you know, to treat your client as yeah. a priority. That means you're getting rid of some of that stuff, and now it's like. I have to show them, hey, you are my priority, but I also need to do these other things that's, that's part of my, for my yeah. family too. So balancing, like I'm learning it right now, but I'm just telling you that's, <laughs> still, that's my, uh, I'm still, that's yeah. my focus right now is in, I'm going to, I've had a vision, uh, years ago, we bought a houseboat in Lake Powell and the whole vision was we're taking all of our adult children down there and our grandkids that's awesome. and it always gets fluttered with something else. Right. This week is that what's is happening? The, this week is the first time. So when you have a vision and you work to make that bi- vision, and it's starting to happen. So this week, wow. after twelve years of having this boat, this vision's going to happen. So I'm just like, I just hope it's everything that I've I've been working. And how for. many? So how many are we talking on the boat? I uh, will be uh, four that? little kids, and adult wise, there will be. 14 adults. Okay. So not too bad. Your boat can handle it. Yeah. That's that's awesome. Bad. And it's that's exciting. I, I, my first Lake Powell trip was last year on that boat. That was one of the best trips ever. Yeah. I, still, I remember so. it all the time. Um, awesome. So you guys, um, just want to recap a little bit. There's some things that we talked about that I really love that, that he's doing. And, you know, we're talking about balance. We're talking about letting go of um, outcomes, you know, controlling things. And we're talking about just just... Working hard and being honest and, and good. That was one of the things I liked about your site is I, I saw the reviews and some other places and I talked to a few people. It seemed to be some common threads and they were like, he's got integrity, he doesn't cut corners, he, you know, it's all about quality and, and that's what we've talked about. Yep. You're, you're not trying to build 100 homes and just make a profit. You know, it's, you're doing things that matter and you want things to, be, to last for a while. Yeah. And um, so anyway, yeah, a lot of great lessons. Um, and I could brag on him for a while, but I won't because I know it doesn't make him comfortable. But um, he's had a lot of great success. And one of my favorite characteristics about this man is he's had it, but it doesn't go to his head. He, um, there, there's a level of humility, and I, I think that's powerful. I think people relate to that. I think people look up and appreciate that. So anyway, um, Thank you for, for taking some time Thanks on Saturday to, morning. Thanks for the and, and now I'm up. I'm up. You know, it's Saturday morning. I got all this time. Well, I have a lot. I, if you needed something to do, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm, to do I'm always up, man. I say that. I'm up at <laughs> six, man. I don't sleep. Yeah. Anyway, thank you guys for tuning into this episode of The Company Next Door, and we'll see you on the next episode.